So the shoreline is one of the most important lines on the planet. <clears throat> it's where most of the world's people live, most of the big cities are, and as you all know, most of the most valuable and desirable property. But after about 8,000 years of relative stability, the shoreline is moving, it's moving towards us. It's moving towards us because sea level is rising, <clears throat> and sea level is rising because the planet's warming, and that's doing two things. It's actually raising the temperature of seawater, which increases its volume, and it's melting the ice on the planet. And all ice melts at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican. So this is just a simple plot of the sort of changes in global temperature over 140 years using, <clears throat> excuse me, the base of 1900 to about 1960, um, which gives us this sort of zero line. And these are anomalies. These are differences in those years relative to that standard period. So what you can see, <clears throat> we're now about two degrees Fahrenheit above sort of the average of the early part of the last century up to mid-century. So there's, there's not a question that the planet is warming. Um, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but just to give you a sense that there's a real connection. This is going back from zero or present day on the right back to about 450,000 years ago. And this is from ice cores, <clears throat> primarily from the Antarctic um, and also sea level measurements. And what you can see are periods when it's had global temperatures in the middle, it's been warmer and cooler and warmer and cooler. You, there you go. You've muted yourself. Okay. How much did you miss? It's okay. Um, <clears throat> so these are the ice ages, roughly 100,000 years long, but we can see the temperature is following carbon dioxide levels and sea level, as I mentioned to begin with, is following temperature. The warmer it gets, the more the ocean expands and the more ice melts. But what we can see here is <clears throat> the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is now about 40 to 45 percent higher than any time in the last actually 850,000 years and it's it's still rising. Um, we now have really good global climate records from a number of different sources. We've been drilling in the ocean basins for now well over 50 years and those sediment cores give us temperature records by changes in the fossil record. Back about 65 million years, we've now been drilling into the ice in Antarctica. We've gone down about two miles and in the bubbles contained in the ice, which is bits of air that have been trapped, we can actually get changes in atmospheric chemistry like carbon dioxide that give us temperature. And those go back about 850,000 years, southern, so to Eastern California, we have bristlecone pines that have really well-developed tree rings that are temperature climate dependent. Those go back about 5,000 years. And we also, interestingly enough, have deep sea corals off California that have a stem much like a tree. <clears throat> and they also record regular layers that reflects the temperature, the chemistry of the overlying water. So we have really good temperature records now going back millions of years. Um, as the earth is warmed and cooled, sea level has risen and fallen. So ocean water expands as it warms, ice melts. So this is the level of the ocean going back uh, about 400 and, well, 370,000 years. Number of ways we can determine this. And what we can see is sea level has been uh, down as far as 400 feet lower than today and 20 or 30 feet higher than today. Um, so we call sea level, which sets property boundaries and state ownership zero today, but virtually any other time in the past, the shoreline would have been someplace else. And that's important to understand. Um, <clears throat> so these are again, these roughly 100,000 year glacial cycles. We go into a glacial period, which we ended the last one about 20,000 years ago. 
sea level was 400 feet lower. And then as it warmed, we rose, raised the ocean up to about where it is today. So we took about 10 million cubic miles of seawater, evaporated it and put it on the land as glaciers and ice sheets. So now we're in a warm period and everything else being equal, which it rarely is, we would expect over thousands of years to go back into another glacial cycle, but <clears throat> human impacts have now uh, affected this. This is a blow up of just that last roughly 20,000 years. It's reversed now. So here the last ice age ended about 20,000 years ago. Sea level rose relatively quickly till about 8,000 years ago, maybe a half an inch a year. But within that period of, that's the average rise, within that period of time, there was some pulses where it rose very rapidly, maybe an inch a year, which is about eight feet per century. Um, and we believe this is when ice sheets in Antarctica collapse, which is what we're concerned about today. Um, and then about 8,000. Doctor, you hit me again. Thank you. Yeah, it says somebody else is doing that. So um, about 8,000 years ago, it leveled off. Um, and it turns out this period of relatively stable sea level corresponds with almost the entire history of human civilization. Um, very slow rise, maybe a millimeter per year. This is the rate we're seeing now. Uh, the last 10 years or so, it's averaged about four and a half millimeters per year. Um, or 18 inches per century. But in fact, all the indications are that rate of rise is accelerating. So this is gonna be the real problem we faced uh, or facing now in some places, but into the future. Um, this is just sort of a short video, seconds actually, of the coast of, from Santa Cruz to central California. This is where the coastline was 18,000 years ago. And you can see San Francisco and SFO. And as the last ice age ended and the ice melted, um, sea level began to rise. So this is the shoreline. The Farallones were part of the coast. Ocean moving into San Francisco Bay, maybe eight or 9,000 years ago. Seawater went all the way up to Sacramento. And then the sediments, filling and so forth has filled a lot of that in. But that's what happened here over the last roughly 18,000 years. Um, we're not supposed to do that again. If we look at Monterey Bay, all along the coast of the world in California, we can actually see the continental shelf, this shallow area out to a depth of about 400 feet. That was where the shoreline was 18,000 years ago. As the ice melted and seawater expanded, sea level rose. So at Santa Cruz, shoreline moved inland about 10 miles over that uh, 10,000. About 5.3 feet per year, the shoreline was moving back. But this gives us an idea of sort of what was out there. We could have walked 10 miles off Santa Cruz and been on dry land. In the Southern California, Los Angeles area, this is the edge of the continental shelf. This would have all been dry land 18,000 years ago. So the shoreline there retreated about three feet per year over the last 18,000 years to give us the shoreline today, which is again, is a geologic time, a temporary feature. <clears throat> For years, we used tide gauges water level recorders at a number of places around the world to record sea level rise. The problem is with tide gauges is they are attached to the land. So we have 12 of those along the California coast. There's one at LA Long Beach and Santa Barbara and San Diego and La Jolla and San Francisco. <clears throat> because they're attached to the land, they are influenced by what the land is doing. So if the land is rising or the land is sinking, it will tell us what sea level is doing relative to land, but that's not an absolute. It's a local or relative number. And they vary around the world. Places like Venice are sinking, New Orleans is sinking, Northern California is rising. So in 1993, 
some really brilliant people figured out how to measure sea level rise from space very precisely. So we now have from 93 to the present, <clears throat> 27 years of absolute sea level rise. It's averaging about 3.4 millimeters a year or 13 inches per century. But if you look at the plot, it's actually an increasing slope. And so we're now at about 18 inches per 100 years, but that rate continues to accelerate. The concern is the ice out there sitting around at various places on the earth. And we actually have ice in sort of three big deposits. One are the continental glaciers. These are the, uh, the Alps, the Andes, Patagonia, the Himalayas. <clears throat> if we melted, this happens to be Patagonia on the lower left. If we melted all that ice, sea level would rise about two feet. We could handle that. Well, most places could. Greenland is the next largest. There's a lot of ice sitting on Greenland. If we melted all that, sea level would rise about 24 feet. That's a lot. A lot of places in the world, uh, hundreds of millions of people live much less than 24 feet above sea level. And then there's Antarctica, which is the sort of 800 pound grill in the room. If we melt all of Antarctica, that would add 190 feet. So cumulatively, we have <laughs> over 200 feet of sea level rise contained in the ice. Um, that has all melted in the geologic past under certain conditions. Uh, this isn't gonna melt this century or next century, but we don't need all 216 feet. Um, two or three feet, five feet make a big difference, but this is something a lot of scientists now are trying to figure out. In the short to intermediate term, we have a greater concern and that's short-term events. Tsunamis are one, which isn't a big deal on the California coast, but we have El Nino events, we have high tides uh, and waves occurring simultaneously. So this is the tide gauge, the official water level recorder um, from San Francisco. And you can see that sea level is rising. It's rising on average um, two millimeters a year, actually lower than the global average. But in this record of sea level rise are these blips or these peaks, about 12 inches. And those are big El Nino events. So back in the early 40s, these will you remember, 1983, 97, 98, and 2015, 16, we had big events. So 12 inches is decades of sea level rise. So when we get this combined with large waves and high tides, those are gonna have more impact than sea level rise alone. I'm gonna say until probably at least mid-century, but those are cumulative. So Sea level is this ramp with an increasing slope and these events are occurring on top of that. So there's two areas or two types of environments, whether you're a real estate agent or whether you're a homeowner or buyer or local government that we need to be concerned about. One is low-lying areas. These are gonna be subject to short-term flooding and over the long-term permanent inundation. And just to give you a sense, you may know the area of Capitola um, a few miles from where I am today. A nice summer picture of Capitola, people sitting out here having their lattes and reading the newspaper. This is a few months later, um, combined El Nino, high tide storm waves. Capitola is very low lying, basically built sort of on a low coastal plain. Um, another area nearby Rio Del Mar, this is uh, Beach Drive. The El Nino of 1983 came took the beach away, came over the wall into the most of these homes along the beach, which are two and three and $4 million homes. Um, this is Marin County, right after you cross the Golden Gate Bridge. This isn't flooding, but this is water from San Francisco Bay at a very high tide. And then part of Huntington Beach, again, this isn't rain, this is seawater and Balboa. Very, very low lying. Uh, odd to see a person on a paddleboard in the street, but this is what we're experiencing now with no additional sea level. I feel like I don't need to say anything about this photograph. This is up north of Ventura. Um, and I don't know 
what this woman is doing, except opening the door. <laughs> um, so these are the kinds of things that do periodically occur in low-lying areas. The other environment, in addition to low relief shoreline areas, are coastal cliffs and bluffs and dunes. Um, the higher sea level gets, the more frequently waves will attack the base of the bluff or cliff, and the quicker the cliffs will retreat. This happens to be Pacifica, south of San Francisco, uh, where these cliffs are not rock, but they're dirt. <laughs> this was an attempt to salvage these apartments, which have now all been demolished. Um, some of you may be familiar with Isla Vista or even have children in school there. Um, this is a photo of student housing, some of the apartments taken about 2005. <clears throat> the next picture is taken about 10 years later. And you can see the front of these three apartments have all been taken off. These decks have been taken off and this is gonna continue to erode. So this is a bluff top erosion problem. Capitola. Again, a picture taken in 1972, um, there was a duplex here, apartments and an oceanfront road, Grand Avenue. But by 2010, you can see that duplex is gone. The apartments are gone. And if you were to take that road now, you would end up in the water. Um, that road has been removed. And this cliff has been eroding at about a foot per year for probably a century. Um, we also have development on dunes. This is Pajaro Dunes, uh, Southern Santa Cruz County where the 1983 El Nino with elevated sea levels and storm waves and high tides um, cut back into the dunes and ultimately led to a uh, major revetment. So with the concerns about rising sea, um, in the end of Jerry Brown's term, he was beginning to read about problems that we were trying to sort out in Antarctica with sea level rise. And he asked for a report to be done uh, by the California Ocean Sciences Trust. Um, I was asked to chair that committee. We had two months to do it. So this came out in 2017. And then a year later, the Ocean Protection came out with a uh, report called the guidance document. And this gives ideas, recommendations on what we should be thinking about and what we've discovered of concern is in Antarctica, again, there's about 190 feet of cumulative sea level out there. There's these massive glaciers um, that are being held in by floating ice shelves. And what is happening as the air gets warmer, it's starting to melt into those ice shells from the top, destabilizing them as well. The water is getting warmer, which is coming in under them destabilizing them from the bottom. And these shelves can only stand so high, they begin to crack off. So it's when these begin to break off, the glaciers can advance into the water. And we don't understand exactly when that's gonna happen, but it's starting to happen now. Sort of like the cork in a champagne bottle. When you pull this cork out, those glaciers can advance. So if you're familiar with either of those reports and they're both available online, the guidance document, um, normally I wouldn't show a bunch of numbers in the report, but I think it's important to at least get the idea of what's in the documents. These are based on each of California's 12 tide gauges. So they go from Crescent City to San Diego. You can pick the one closest to you. Um, <clears throat> down the left side are emission scenarios. How much carbon dioxide we continue to emit. Um, and those don't have a lot of effect on the short term, but as you go further out into time, and these dates go from 2030, just 10 years into the future, 2050 up to 2100. And then these are sort of probability estimates like any other thing, you know, how long will we live? What's our life insurance based on? And there's a median value, which is a 51st chance, 50% chance sea level will be higher or lower than that. These are in feet for San Francisco. There's a more likely range. There's a two thirds probability it'll lie between, let's just say 2030 and high emissions, it'll be between 0.3 and 0.5 feet by in the next 10 years. There's a one in 20 chance. It'll be a little over half a foot. 
there's a one in 200 chance it could be 0.8 feet. And there's an extreme scenario, which is theoretically possible in Antarctica from the ice melt, but we don't know exactly yet what that's gonna be. And we can go out to 2050 all the way to 2100. And these numbers by 2100 can get pretty big. It could be 10 feet, it could be three feet, it could be seven feet. And it really is the age of your house. And this is what I think started the conversation um, about what are insurance companies doing and what are mortgage companies doing. And these are the kinds of things that they are gonna have to look at. Um, just a few local examples. This is area you may know, Balboa Island. Um, has about, last time I looked, about four billion in assessed home value. Um, but water is already coming over the low wall into Balboa. Um, and they recently spent close to two million to raise it, I believe nine inches um, short term. There's a couple of sites you can use uh, that cover the coastlines of anywhere in California. Uh, one is called Surging Seas by an organization called Climate Central. The other is by NOAA, uh, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, it's called the Sea Level Rise Viewer. And they're based on the most precise land elevations we have today. So this is Balboa Island in Newport at present day high tide. But what you can do on this side is raise sea level one foot. And you can see what starts to happen one foot above high tide Parts of Balboa Island are already, and the edge here, are already going underwater with one foot. We can raise it to three feet. All of Balboa is below sea level and most of this coastline. You can actually go all the way up to 30 feet, but I'm not gonna bother. Um, but we can do this in San Francisco or San Diego or La Jolla, wherever you want. So it's a good indicator, very precise. Um, on the coast, it's different because we have a wave run up and so forth, but for inland areas, it's basically raising the water in the bathtub. This came out a couple of years ago. Coastal Commission says prepare for the worst. That's not a requirement, but consideration. So what's next? What do we do? Um, basically, there's four options. There aren't a lot of options. One is denial or wait and see. We can nourish the beach, try to add more sand to the beach. We can build seawalls, revetments. <clears throat> this is the one that no homeowner wants to hear. These have become uh, bad words to use. It's been called managed retreat, relocation, planned retreat. Um, so we can go with a denial. This is what Florida and Miami and places have done for decades. And now they're beginning to feel the cost of that. They are also hurricane prone. Beach nourishment has been practiced so along the East Coast for years, um, different kind of shoreline. It tends to be very expensive and very short lived. California's main nourishment project for nourishment's sake, in addition to just dredging harbors was in San Diego where this was done twice, 2001, 2012. They moved about three and a half million cubic yards of sand. And for reference, a cub 10 cubic yards is about a dump truck load. So this is 350,000 dump truck loads of sand was put on 12 different areas of San Diego beaches, cost $46 million and they were gone in one to two years. Very, very expensive and short lived. Armor. At present, about 14% of the entire coast of California has been armored. By armor, I mean revetments, seawalls. But for Southern California's four southernmost counties, San Diego, Orange, LA, Ventura, 38% has been armored. But you may be well aware of the fact that that era has essentially ended. Uh, the California Coastal Commission is going back to the original language in the Coastal Act that says if an existing structure can be uh, protected if you jump through all these hoops, but anything built after 1977 is no longer going to be allowed new protection. And even older structures, if they've been modified or improved, it's going to be very, very difficult. So I think many homeowners perhaps felt that this was going to be a way to solve their erosion issues, this has is, um, sort of entered a whole new era. And then we have retreat. Um, not a lot of examples. We move back to Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. 
cost about $12 million. We've moved a few houses around California. A few examples that have been put out there is plans. One is the Great Highway in San Francisco. Uh, they decide they can't protect it any longer. So this would be Ocean Beach. They're actually talking about moving the highway in. Uh, there's not much there. It's, it's a pretty easy place to move the highway in. Ventura has a place where they planned retreat and actually got rid of some parking and a path and moved it inland, sort of a phased project. Um, they put in cobbles under the sand that thinking that would hold off the erosion, but that has been short term so far and it's still retreating. So plan to retreat is probably gonna have to be done in steps. There is one place um, where we actually moved Highway 1 inland up on the San Simeon coast, Piedras Blancas, because it was um, heavily armored. Um, they decided that wasn't the best approach. There's also an elephant seal colony here. So they moved the road three to 500 feet inland. That's one of the few places where we've actually managed some retreat. This has now become a bit of a battleground between some communities and the Coastal Commission because they are asking for communities in their local coastal program revisions to include a plan for managed retreat. Pacifica has said, no, we're not gonna do that. This is where those apartments have been lost. Imperial Beach, Southern San Diego County has said, we're not gonna do that. And Del Mar has said the same thing. So these are low lying areas here and here and, and bluffed areas. Not exactly sure where that will end. And I think the point to keep in mind with managed retreat is this is not gonna occur tomorrow. We don't need to move back tomorrow. People's houses aren't gonna be condemned, but there will come a point with continued global carbon emissions, continued warming and sea level when sea level is gonna rise a foot or two and we could see from those numbers. Um, when we get there, it's gonna be different for each area but we need to start thinking about what's gonna happen 10, 20, 30 years into the future and have a plan. And again, that report that was apparently put on your site recently about property values, I think economics may begin to weigh in more heavily than science. Um, this is a study done by a foundation in New York City and what they've discovered is if you cannot get a loan for your property, the mortgage companies aren't gonna loan you, if, if you can't get, I'm sorry, insurance for your property, the mortgage companies aren't gonna uh, loan you the money. So these are property value declines in billions of dollars for these low lying East Coast areas. My sense is in California, we haven't seen those declines yet. We have a very different coastline, um, but that's probably gonna be a limitation for the future. So a couple of books, if you like reading, um, this is something I've been working on for some time. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago called Coast and Crisis, another book about a little more personal story between a colleague and myself on the edge, the pressured past and precarious future of California's coast. And then uh, two other books. Um, one looks at the entire coast of California and what we know about each county, each region, what the general hazards are, um, and then one that focuses on Monterey Bay, looking at all of the natural disasters from floods and earthquakes to coastal storms. So I won't say it's pleasure reading, but it might be important for some of you. So I'm gonna stop there and we'll, um, happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> Questions? I don't see any in the chat box yet. I've had a lot of very positive remarks to your presentation for uh, Dr. Griggs, so thank you for that. If anybody has a question, please raise your hand. I see uh, Paul. Go ahead, Paul, unmute. Here we go. Uh, Dr. Griggs, could you comment? I just uh, watched a film called Kiss the Ground. And the theme of the book is that we can recapture carbon by changing our farming methods and actually stop the increase in carbon. I don't know if you've seen it, what you think of that. The other question I have is, do you think offshore reefs, artificial reefs have much chance? And the third one is, uh, 
all our our uh, Dr. Griggs, can you hear me? Whether we can sequester it in farmland or kelp forests or tropical rainforests, um, I think there's potential benefits, but there's some huge obstacles to overcome. Um, you know, we keep these forest fires in California are going the opposite direction. We're burning up the vegetation that's, that could be taking that out. Um, so I'm not gonna put down any of those except to say there's huge volume problems to deal with. Um, offshore reefs, um, and I guess there's two sorts of reefs. There's actual reefs, you know, Tahiti, whatever, where we, which occur in tropical waters. And those definitely can help buffer the coastlines from wave attack. Although reefs are now under stress from increasing acidification of the ocean, which you're probably all familiar with, but the more carbon dioxide we release, the more acidic the ocean becomes. So there's a lot of work going on today trying to figure out <clears throat> how fast that's happening. It's not just coral, but it's anything that makes a shell out of calcium carbonate. So mussels and clams and crabs. And when you think about trying to change the pH of the entire ocean, all 235 million cubic miles, that's a big order. We built offshore breakwaters in places, which I guess we could call a reef. Um, we do that in Europe. California, not very much. A couple near Santa Monica, very expensive. There's a lot of hazards that are created and the Coastal Commission is not really excited about that. Um, let's see, the third question, where's Paul? Right here. Uh, the, the third question had to do with the fact that our, our runoff control policies oh, oh, okay. have, are preventing uh, new sand from new sediment from reaching the ocean, which is right. where sand comes from. Yeah, we've actually done a lot of work on that in California, how much has been reduced from different drainage basins. Um, and a lot, about a third of maybe the total amount of sediment depends on whether we're in Southern California where we have many more debris basins and dams versus Northern California. <laughs> and it turns out somehow rivers are figuring out how to pick up sand between the dam and the coast because in general, the beach width reduction doesn't fit with dam construction. <laughs> um, but the other, the other piece of that is where we've armored the coast, we put in a barrier. If, if When I showed you those original images of where sea level was or where the coast was 18,000 years ago, it was 10 miles offshore. As the shoreline migrated landward, the beach just moved with it. But once we put in a wall, a highway, a railroad, a sea, a sea wall, a revetment, the shoreline can no longer migrate inland. So there's a process we've called passive erosion, which is we drown, we flood those beaches. So it's just, it will get down to, and maybe Del Mar is a good example. Do we save private property or public beaches? Because we're gonna lose all those beaches and the US Geological Survey has done this for Southern California and says, well, by you know, 2060, we could lose two thirds of our beaches because there's no place for them to retreat to. Really, no matter how much sand we add to the beach, sea level's still gonna keep rising. I hate to put a wet blanket on all those, Paul, but those are really thoughtful questions. Okay, hey, we have a hand up with Steve Hanley if you wanna unmute. And I have two questions in the chat and that's gotta be it because uh, we have more to get to in our meeting today. So uh, we really appreciate it, Dr. Griggs. But Steve, uh, if you could okay. ask your question now. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Griggs. This has been really informative. Um, I, my interest is in the Monterey Bay area where I happen to have a place on the inland side of Del Monte Road, right next to Del Monte Beach. And for years, uh, the sand uh, nutrition 
was being prevented by the Semex plant, which we were finally uh, successful in getting to close, I think, at the end of this year. Um, they were blamed for a lot of the loss of sand and the erosion of the beaches. Um, we're hoping that the regen that the closing of that plant of the sand mine will allow the Salinas River to let its let its normal uh, you know sand issuance replenish the beaches naturally. Do you think that's viable? And if so, how long will it take? Really good question. <laughs> and I don't think there's any question that CMAX virtually a century of sand mining, and there actually used to be four other sand mines mm -hmm. there. When those closed, CMEX increased their extraction volumes to equal what the other ones were. One of the problems is this, the Salinas River doesn't deliver as much sand as it used to. There's a couple of dams on the Salinas River. Um, a lot of water gets extracted from it for agriculture uses. Um, mm. I don't think we're actually gonna see any big change. The Salinas River, not directly tied to the sand mining. Um, we may see um, the beaches not eroding as quickly, but I seriously doubt we're gonna see the beaches growing with, with sea level rise and El Ninos and so forth. I just don't think um, the beaches are gonna get wider. Follow up question, if I may. They're talk, the city of Monterey is talking about creating reserves of sand from some of the approved developments up towards Marina, you know, in between Watsonville and, and Marina, where there's a ton of dune uh, available. <laughs> would, would pushing that part of those dunes into the ocean help replenish the supply? Because the way I see it, if Monterey doesn't maintain the Del Monte Beach, and the wharves, the economy of that whole area is gonna get pounded. Uh, you've got hotels, Cannery Row, the aquarium, you know, all of those really, really wonderful places that, that the tourist economy um, you know, supports the Monterey Peninsula. So something has to be done you know, to maintain it in my book. Uh, I mean, any, any thoughts on that? Well, what this is a, Another good question. Um, one of the logical questions that comes out, well, let's just take desert sand and put it on the beach. And it turns out dune sand, in order to be picked up by the wind and moved inland is finer grained. It's easier to move than the coarser beach sand. So if you put that fine sand on the beach, it's gonna disappear really quickly. So it's not an easy solution as, as much as it might seem. The other issue is, um, <clears throat> interestingly, most of Northern California, the sand moves from north to south, driven by waves from the north and west. So in <clears throat> northern Santa Cruz, sand moves down the coast and out into Monterey Submarine Canyon at Moss Landing. The southern part of the bay, sand moves north. Mm. Monterey Harbor never has to be dredged. So the sand moves from Monterey, a little bit piles up against the breakwater up into the Monterey Canyon head. <clears throat> One of the things that has been done historically, and we just wrote a paper about we ought to revisit it, is putting in barriers to hold sand in place. We call them groins. They're actually different than jetties, which are built to control entrance harbors. Um, there's one in Capitola that holds the Capitola Beach in place. Um, it was built in 1969. Newport Beach has them, Ventura has them, and they act as sort of a natural headland. So we could construct some of these to hold that sand in place longer. And that would be one way to try to stabilize the existing beaches. <coughs> okay, Go let's on. hit your other two questions if we can. Let's do this. Just to keep us on track, could he answer those in the chat if you have a couple of minutes so that we can put sure. the presentation on and move forward? Dr. Griggs, we are most thankful you've made um, common sense of, of some very difficult issues and we absolutely emphatically appreciate your time today. Your information is actually in the chat for those that uh, want to look you up and and take a look at your uh, uh, at, at the books you recommended. Thank you again so much for your presentation and uh, we will hopefully look forward to seeing you again in the future. Okay, thanks a lot.
Thank you, sir. Thanks. Okay. Presentation back up on the screen.